Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> um, where I come from, you know, we talk about a fog index. If you've sat down for a long time and you've been listening, you, after a while you get a bit of a fog index and you don't know what topic and like. So I think I'll give a minute for you to just rest and absorb what we're going to be talking about. And the topic is just is not as simple as it, is, as it says, achievements and lessons learned to the Muslim minorities. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the organizers for thinking about the Muslim minorities. We're about 400 million of the total population of about 1.8 billion. What more importantly is that there are 48 Muslim majority countries, but there are more countries with Muslim minorities. And they are often forgotten, except when you um, hear them in the news. Yesterday, we had a, a brother from Korea who was saying, include Muslim minorities in future sessions. I'm so pleased that uh, our organizers uh, thought of this, particularly also the Chamber of Commerce as well, who actually invited us for this. Our session today has, uh, and this is by way of you having a fog index time. Session today has some very eminent speakers, and they're from all over the globe, and all, one from the center, of, which is Malaysia. He is um, very well known, Sarawakians. I got to know him recently, uh, apart from being a sports person. He's also an aviation technologist. His PhD in that. He, um, of course, runs the whole trade and investment of Malaysia. A very colorful person. You'll be hearing somebody from the north who's here, from UK, a person who's been at the forefront of various types of Muslim aid programs. And he's coming here as a capacity, as an expert in leadership programs. And we are so lucky to have him. We have also one of the preeminent scientists in, New Ze in, in the world, sorry, I'm New Zealand all the time, um, who is from, um, uh, from Thailand. He's a core scientist in the area of halal, and we can learn a lot. In addition to that, we have people online in this digital world. We have uh, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Patel uh, <clears throat> from South Africa, from the South and also the chairperson of um, Ethan Allen, Farooq Katawi. But before I start, can I also, I know they, you thank us, but let me also, first of all, say thank you for all of you turning up. Can we give a special thanks to the organizers of this? Because I think they have done an excellent job. We only have, um, well, just over 75 minutes, and I don't, you haven't come here to, uh, to listen to me. But let me just give you one context, well, two contexts of why this topic is relevant. On the first day, when we're having the grand dinner, and what a grand dinner it was, there was an item on the main course menu, which was salmon. Now, what has salmon got to do with us? Well, if you know, that salmon would have come from a country like New Zealand or Scotland or Canada. There are two nexus of linkages. They all have Muslim minority, country, uh, Muslim minority countries, and they all have a halal nexus because packaging for salmon, the plastic wrapping, has a type of additive which has actually meat, I mean, a, a non-meat component, a meat component. So it has to be halal, even the packaging. So you can see how complicated the world has become. And in this context, we have somebody who's going to be talking about the halal expert. Our first speaker, if I may introduce, the Honorable Datuk Dr. Malcolm Mussein Alama. He apart from being the Deputy Minister for International Trade, Industry and Investment, Sarawak, what you've heard of today, 
he has been really known to have a cause far beyond just Sarawakans, the whole Muslim Ummah as well. So I'll pass on to Dr. Lamo. Uh, thank you very much. Very good morning and um, salam Sarawak kusayang, a local greeting here uh, to oh, Mr. Uh, moderator Abdul Razak, my colleague here, Sahib, and Dr. Winai. Yeah? Um, taking the cue from a very famous, very common quote, yeah? success is a journey, not a destination. Yeah? Definitely, uh, I feel that we should not raise on our laurels, especially if we want to survive in this very dynamic, uh, challenging uh, business world. So I would confine my um, discussion mainly on the uh, challenges. Challenges, probably some lesson learned from other countries. And of course, I try to give some insight into the projection for the extreme future, yeah? how, we will, how we will survive in this very uh, adverse and very competitive environment. Yeah? Uh, so I will not, inter in the interest of time, uh, I'll give more chance for the, my colleague who come all the way here and rushing to be in the airport, <laughs> so you will not miss this flight. Uh, my concern here is more on the challenges that we are facing. Yeah? Uh, if you look at the climate situation, it, it involves a lot of risk, climate risk. Yeah? Uh, over those uh, few decades, we realized that um, there are a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of occurrence, a lot of uh, calamities that happen around the world uh, with regards to the uh, adverse effect on uh, our climate, be it a flood or drought, and also because the global warming phenomena, we, we tend to uh, realize that there is a very considerable rise in the sea level. Yeah? Uh, this may affect the uh, production of food because most of our arable land will be submerged yeah? by the year 2050. Based on the model, mathematical model, they predict that we may have to uh, undergo a lot of flood issue. Yeah? And uh, the projected rise in sea level was 1.2 meters. Some mathematical model will say it may go into two meters. With that happening, uh, we will have issue with uh, arable land that can be used for food production, uh, be it a Muslim country or most of the uh, countries in the low-laying region of the world. Eh? So we, we need to come up with some models or production system uh, that can uh, allow us uh, to optimize, to maximize production by the use of uh, more advanced technology um, that can uh, more or less assure us of the food security in the long run. Yeah? Imagine that we have to feed around 9 billion people by the year 2050. Yeah? Definitely, we need to go into something uh, that is more productive yeah? in terms of uh, uh, output. Uh, be it from the crop yield or uh, try to reduce the uh, input that are required to produce such volume of food for our consumption. Yeah? And also, if you see what happened in uh, other countries over the years, like uh, water scarcity, uh, be it in uh, Africa or be it in Brazil. Yeah? Uh, Brazil recorded they, there were loss of around 9 billion in the agricultural sector because of low production due to drought. Yeah? And uh, I feel uh, for us to go into, uh, to face food production issues and also our well-being, we need to go to new innovation technology. Yeah? Um, there was a a statement by some people from Institute of Global Future US that emphasized the, the most important power tools 
for us to remain uh, competitive, to be innovative, uh, this four field. One is nanotechnology. Another one is biotechnology. Of course, IT and network, and maybe we need to handle neurotechnology. This will be the, the uh, drivers, the enablers to for allow us to uh, to be competitive, uh, so that we can uh, move on yeah? to ensure that uh, people around the world has enough food to eat. So we may need to think beyond what we have been doing all these years. And uh, I believe my friend here um, can do more on can say more on uh, how. Uh, to promote halal uh, FM, FMGC, yeah? CG, uh, fast-moving consumer goods. Probably our friend from Thailand can explain more <laughs> on halal production. And uh, another aspect is energy security. You realize that uh, Sarawak is being blessed with a lot of natural resources whereby we can use this as an energy hub for the region. Yeah? When we need to move from um, fuel, fossil fuel based to greener energy, be it the hydrogen, ammonia, or solar, yeah? uh, so that we, we can mitigate problem uh, with our global warming phenomena. Yeah? Uh, in that sense, you will realize that there are a lot, be a lot of pressure by countries who are energy deprived as compared to countries which are independent in terms of energy production, especially if they go into that energy transition to a greener, a cleaner and secular economy. Uh, I think with that, I, I will take my time off to listen to the rest of my colleagues to spend time with you. Thank you. Jazakallah. Um, Thank you, uh, Datuk, uh, Dr. Uh, Lamo. I think uh, you, you, your focus on innovation is something which we have heard so loudly from you, and it's important that we consider that. And also your focus on risk mitigation, uh, taking into account the technologies and also our food security. Uh, these are co core areas. Thank you for that. Uh, later on, I mean, I think the next speaker is Ibrahim Patel, am I right? Uh, um, sorry? Okay. 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 Uh, if I could introduce you to Dr. Dahlan, uh, Winay Dahlan. He is uh, founding director of the Halal Science, uh, uh, Dr. Winay, Dr. Ha uh, the Halal Science Center of Chulagong University. He has a flight to catch at 1.30, so I'll... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee for inviting me uh, for this uh, presentation in uh, this uh, very beautiful city. This is my second time to visit uh, uh, this city. Ten years ago, I visited that uh, this city now is a lot of changes. And uh, also thank you for, uh, thank uh, Dato for giving me more time uh, to give uh, some presentation. Uh, my presentation today is about the establishment of the world first halal science institution. Uh, we have some agencies so called the Halal Science Center at Chulalongkorn University. I will give us some information about the Halal Science Center and also Chulalongkorn University as well as Thailand. Thailand uh, is a country in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the neighbor of uh, Malaysia and also Sarawak. And uh, with the population of uh, 70 million, only five to six million of Muslim. 
then it means that we have uh, very few Muslims in uh, my country, around 5 to 7 percent of the population. Uh, but anyway, we try very hard in our country to promote the halal economy. I, I will tell the story. When, when I mentioned that uh, we was the first halal science institution in, in the world, this is not our claim. Uh, we were awarded by the Prime Minister of Malaysia in the year 2006 in, uh, in the event of the World Halal Forum. At that event, there was an announcement that the Halal Science Center was the first ever halal science institution in the world. And it's mentioned in the Halal Journal of Malaysia. Uh, this is uh, our, really our honor, because at that time, I, I, I didn't know that the, the laboratory that I established more than 10 years before was the first halal scientific institution. Uh, this is the establishment of the Halal Science Center at Chulalongkorn University in the year 1995. I initiated the Halal Science Laboratory in Chulalongkorn University in order to initiate the work for Muslim uh, consumer protection. As you may know that uh, we, we have a very minor Muslim uh, population and uh, we are aware of the haram adulteration in the food product available in the country. And in the year 2001, there was a bigger scandal about the haram adulteration happened in Indonesia. In that year, the adulteration is so complicated uh, for the halal industry. And then uh, we finally uh, convinced about the uh, significant of the uh, role of science and technique for backing up the halal accreditation. In the year 2002, uh, Thailand, the government of Thailand uh, finally initiated the policy for establishment of the halal science and technique for backing up the halal food production in the country. We are not Muslim country at that point. We, we so uh, give uh, significance to the science and technology for backing up our halal industry at that time. And then uh, two years later, in the year 2004, the government with the cabinet had the resolution to establish the halal science laboratory, first ever in Chulalongkorn, University and then my laboratory yeah, in the faculty of Allied Health at that time I was the dean of the faculty was raised up to be the halal science laboratory full equipped with uh, many equipment uh, supply from the government of Thailand. Uh, this is the case uh, from Indonesia you will find that the disodium inositate INS-631. This is uh, some chemical used for uh, producing uh, some taste enhancer uh, in the industry. They produce from the tapioca. This is halal, use uh, bacteria fermentation, and also use the broth that so-called uh, uh, that the broth is uh, produced from the company from Canada. And finally, they found that they use also the enzyme, pancreas, pancreatic enzyme from the pig. This is finally is uh, uh, make the concern uh, for the Muslim consumer in Indonesia. And uh, we also found from the Halal Science Center at that time, that there's not only INS-631, there's also other 186 
chemicals have the same characteristic. It means that there are plenty of uh, uh, chemicals available in the halal industry. It contaminate, uh, contaminated uh, with some kind of a haram. This is uh, convinced us that we really need the assistance from science and tech, technology to back up and assist the Islamic scholar uh, for the halal accreditation. Uh, this is the case also happened uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, 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 two, two or three years ago, you will find that uh, the vaccine uh, produced from uh, some kind uh, with the application of uh, some uh, protein, trypsin, may produce from pig. This is uh, finally uh, stir the concern of the Muslim consumer. And uh, finally, we found that uh, it's not the pig they used uh, some kind of the plant for pro production of the trypsin. But anyway, if they use a trypsin protein, ulama have to understand if finally they can uh, consider whether it's istihala or istih istilak uh, according to the Sharia. Because finally they use uh, plenty of water to flush out all uh, haram uh, from the production of the vaccine. Or finally, they transform the structure of the protein uh, to be another site. Can we consider it as the istahala? And even finally, we cannot uh, uh, consider all, all the sharia. Uh, they can consider that is uh, is. Uh, it's a daru raw. It's very essential to use uh, for for the production of the uh, vaccine. This is mean that we really need the explanation uh, from the sign and technique for the ulama to understand well about the situation of the uh, of the Sharia. This is very need the person who can communicate with the uh, Sharia person to understand about the role of the science technology for halal uh, accreditation. This is Chula Longkorn. Finally, the government established the halal uh, science laboratory at the Chula Longkorn Uni University. We have uh, four offices uh, in the country, in the Chiang Mai, uh, in the north of the country, in the south, in Patani, and also in Nakhon Nayok. We have uh, several branches of our office. We have one lab with the area of 2,000 square meters uh, with uh, more than 200 uh, scientific equipments and uh, seven uh, PhD scientists together with uh, 30 uh, all Muslim scientists working there. First thing, when we discuss about the science technology for halal, some uh, may focus on the laboratory, but this is not. We better discuss about the supply chain, how to implement the science technology throughout the supply chain for the halal uh, manufacturing process. This is how we work. And this is, we establish uh, some kind of a science technology implemented uh, throughout the supply chain. Uh, for, for instance, about the laboratory, about the uh, halal standardization system. Okay, I will go quite far. This is the system that we developed for halal standardization, we so-called HALQ. Throughout the uh, industrial uh, manufacturing process, we implement the system uh, quite uh, similar to ISO, quite similar to ISO, we, we, we call it the uh, HALQ+. Uh, you find that uh, in that system, we set up uh, the H number. This is the book of the H number. Uh, we analyze the food sample totaling of 188,731 food uh, product. And then finally, we uh, 
uh, tablet, all of the that ingredient, and make the H number. This is the first ever H number. Yeah, that we use for the halal industry in Thailand, and also set up the uh, laboratory procedure uh, for the halal uh, assessment. Okay, this is uh, the system uh, received uh, several uh, award uh, from the country and also uh, internationally. This is uh, our laboratory that uh, finally we established. Very good uh, laboratory as if certified by ISO 17025 and also ISO uh, 9001. This is uh, fully equipped with the scientific equipment uh, develop many techniques for the halal and haram uh, laboratory analysis. And then this is the sample of the laboratory that we use at the Halal Science Center, Jolanokorn University. You'll find that there are plenty of the technique that develop in our laboratory and also a book for that. And then this is the halal number that uh, finally uh, to establish this work, finally we work closely with the uh, Fatwa Council of Sheikh Al-Islam of Thailand. Uh, this is a Fatwa by uh, Sheikh Al-Islam of Thailand. And very important, uh, finally, from the cabinet resolution in the year uh, uh, 2019, uh, in order to establish the halal blockchain, this is the first ever that we developed the blockchain for the halal standardization. You will see that uh, from the system of the half queue. Finally, we lock each step with the NFT non fungible uh, token uh, step by step. And finally, we develop the halal blockchain. This is already finish and uh, we have the first blockchain available in, uh, in, in Thailand for the halal industry and also uh, we developed the application for halal tourism that we call halal route. Okay, this is a uh, uh, for the development of the innovative Islamic prophetic uh, food, cosmetic, and pharmaceutical product. Uh, we use uh, several products from, uh, 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 from the Hadith. Uh, for, for example, the oil of the Hapatus Sauda and encapsulate uh, with the prebiotic, with the pre, uh, prebiotic. And then uh, finally, we produce uh, some uh, form of the product. And then uh, finally, finally, we have the uh, intellectual property for this kind of uh, product and available uh, in Thailand. This is uh, for our uh, uh, innovative uh, Islamic prophetic product. And uh, we use uh, precision farming technology. Okay, I assure you, this is uh, some, and according to all of our uh, work, uh, I myself uh, had been uh, named as the one of the 500 most influential Muslim by the government of uh, Jordan for 15 years. Thank you very much. For 15 years, uh, from the year 2010 to the, uh, f uh, until to the next year. Uh, this is uh, uh, the sample of the how to develop the halal side laboratory and also the halal side uh, procedure for backing up the halal accreditation as well as the halal uh, food production in my country, Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, um, Professor Dharan. Um, as an achievement and uh, that you have contributed for not just the um, uh, minority Ummah, but also Ummah, Muslim Ummah worldwide, this center is actually 
a real Muslim center of excellence. I know you have to get going, so unfortunately he won't be able to answer any questions. Uh, have a safe trip. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could introduce you to um, the chairman and founder of uh, MacAndrew Leadership in the UK, uh, Dr. Saif Ahmed, he's uh, very well known in the UK. Uh, he's also known, um, he was just telling me the story of how he met Mahathir and um, how Mahathir remembered him and spent a whole day with him in UK. Uh, I won't say, give him any more introduction because he's actually a, a very well-known speaker. So, Dr. Sai. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, today's presentation by my brother, Dr. Malcolm, when he talk about innovation, creativity, it reminded me <clears throat> a story of 50 years ago. I, um, I was uh, in my final year in the school. There was a competition of the f f population growth and food problem of the country. So I wrote an article because uh, the pressure at that time that the population growth is based on geometrical process and the Malthusian theory saying that uh, uh, the food production goes on arithmetic level. But I thought, Brother Abdul Razak, Razak is Allah. Allah is the provider of rizq for all creatures. So my small mind as a child did not convince me that the productivity of this earth is final. So my essay, uh, the essay that I wrote, I said the earth has not been totally explored, particularly the food within the ocean and the productivity of the land if it, the land can produce twice in a year, there is no reason why it cannot do it four times, five times. So, Brother Malcolm's confirmed that innovation and creativity can produce results. And same thing happened 50 years down the line, the country that I was born in, Bangladesh, has been full, food secure, that has been bump, a lot more production from 70 million to now almost 170 million, the nation is about to, uh, is uh, feeding the nation by the grace of God. And in the health sector, progress enormous, stability, growth rate, better than neighboring countries. It shows the resilience and perseverance of the Muslim nation. I just given one example, one country, that it has progressed. I would like to share some of the success stories of the Muslims living as a minority. I mean, sometimes we hear stories of despair, that uh, future seems to be bleak. I, I would like to say, akhirah to khairul laka min al The akhirah, the future, will be better, brighter than the present. The resilience of the Muslim community in the West is enormous. In terms of identifying new initiative, living in the West, I would say a couple of examples which would perhaps inspire our audience. <clears throat> there is a statistics uh, so research carried by University of Dublin. It says that Muslims living in a, um, in a minority situation are much more persevering and they are achieving much greater success than the Muslims living in a majority nations. Out of nearly two billion people, approximately 30 million Muslims live in the West and their age is below 15, 33%. Very youthful population. Same story goes to Africa. Around half of the uh, continent uh, our in inhabitants are the, uh, from the Islamic faith, and 60% of the population are below the age of 30. So this youthful population, a couple of things that I explained to you. One is one initiative in the UK was called Halal Eat, a British startup. 
and 2015 to identify where you can go and find halal food so that you don't need to, uh, need to really move around. You will have an app. An Islamic GPS a reality app is initiated in 2016 to find mosque and Islamic landmarks worldwide. The founder was an Iqbal Hussein. He is also now aiming to teach the history of the Muslim world in an innovative manner to make the understanding of the Islamic faith, which is an uh, universal faith, faith to bring humanity together rather than dividing them. So he's coming ahead uh, with that initiative. Uh, the, on the fashion design, I think I find it difficult to pronounce, but the Hout Ilan is 213, a modern fashion uh, sort of designers, over, getting over 200 designers, having a showroom in London, which promotes the modest fashion industry, which is very popular now, getting popular. There was a young Muslim man, now uh, older, Sir Anwar Parvez, who created the best way wholesale, a major uh, uh, chain of wholesale industries across Europe. Rij Ahmed, the actor and rapper, who is now addressing the social media, very social media, very much uh, prominent, come from the Islamic faith. Ismail Hussein, from a Somali background, he established the World Remit, a digital money transfer services based in England. Another young man, Adim Yunus, who is the founder of singlemuslim.com, which is the largest marriage website, Muslim marriage website in the world, having millions of people finding their spouse through that process. And USA, similar sort of initiative has been taken by the Muslims. Halal Pija, Halal Wings Plus, Ariana Halal Market, Halal Guys, Islamic Housing Corporation for the home buyers. Those are all new innovation and initiative taken by the Muslims. In Africa, in Nigeria particularly, 213 million people and out of that, half of the population are considered to be from the Islamic faith. They ventured in technology, agriculture, fashion, etc. The one group called Boa Group, Abdul Samad Rubin, the oil and gas and manufacturers, is a uh, significant success story. Dangote Group from Aliko Dangote, the conglomerate group, they uh, produce cement, sugar, oil, and gas, and prominent in the whole of Africa uh, is a Muslim initiative. Zai's Bank, the Islamic scholars and the business people, they have created this in Nigeria. The Sukuk market to the outstanding 1.6 billion dollar issuance of um, uh, Sukuk. An Islamic finance industry in, 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 uh, in Nigeria currently worth over 2.9 billion. Now they're talking about the, we are talking about the issues of this uh, challenges. Challenges are enormous. Discrimination and Islamophobia, access to finance, cultural sensitivity, etc. remains. And Muslim community is finding a way to deal with it in a manner which is consistent with the Islamic values. I just want to touch two items to revive that even at this distant time, there are hopes. A country called Burkina Faso, with nearly 22 million people, 64% are Muslim. The young man called Ibrahim Trarore, who has taken over the country's leadership as a, from a military captain, he has taken two aspects. One, that he does not take any presidential salary. He wants to live with the spirit of sacrifice. Within nine months, in an impoverished Africa, he has maintained 100 kilometers of road that he has created. Another country, El Salvador, the late Armando Bukele Katan, 
is the father of the, if this gentleman died, is the father of the current president of El Salvador, <clears throat> created initiative to introduce Islam in El Salvador and to promote interfaith dialogue within El Salvador is very, very prominent. So all these sayings that <coughs> Muslim communities as a minority are not sitting idle. They're finding their ways to promote the harmonious message of Islam, promote the message of coexistence, message of tolerance, message of understanding and brotherhood. And that is what I feel that the Muslim community in the West particularly is emerging as a forceful community to bring about a positive change across the globe. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Um, the accomplishments of the individuals and the organizations in the UK, US, South America, Africa uh, are really, really notable. And thank you for summarizing that. Um, I note that we only have about 20 minutes to go. We have two other speakers which are online. Are we proceeding with that, organizers? Or shall we go into question and answers? Excellencies, distinguished guests, respected friends, Honorable Datuk Dr. Malcolm Lamour, Deputy Minister for Trade, fellow panelists, our moderator Faraz Khan. Assalamu alaikum. I greet you with the universal greeting of peace. It is with great regret that due to extenuating circumstances, I am not able to be present with you in the lovely city of Kuching in the beautiful state of Sarawak. Sadly, I will be missing out on the Laksa Sarawak. Permit me the opportunity to share with you some of the experiences of the Muslim community of South Africa. According to 2023 official statistics, the Muslim population of South Africa is just under 1 million, or 1.5% of the total population of 62 million. Yet, this small community contributes 15% to the total GDP of the country, is able to influence policy, plays an important role in the country, and Muslims are seen as an integral part of the nation. South Africa has a high number of halal certified producers, including the major MNCs, has a growing Islamic finance industry with four of the largest conventional banks having Islamic banking subsidiaries, a number of Sharia compliant listed mutual funds, and the government has just issued a RAND denominated Ijara Sovereign Supuk. Statistics from the Banking Council show that Sharia mutual funds have investments of close to 40 billion US dollars. Cash deposits in Islamic banking are around 10 billion US dollars and lendings equate to around 12 billion US dollars. Muslims occupy positions as leaders of businesses, including numerous listed companies, top sports persons, heads of academic institutions, world renowned scientists and heads of government departments. It's interesting to note that the largest cooking oil manufacturer in Southern Africa, the largest Mercedes-Benz dealership group, the largest BMW dealership group, one of the largest independent car rental companies, a steel extrusion manufacturer, one of the largest FMCG distributors, and a large clothing manufacturer are some of the notable Muslim-owned businesses today. This growth of Muslim businesses comes against the backdrop of the restrictive and punitive laws under the apartheid government, which prevented the entry of non-white businesses into any field except retailing and some manufacturing. And even within this, there were restrictions on where these businesses could be located, their customers and the growth of those businesses. From the period 1860, when the first documented Muslims arrived in South Africa to 1994, when apartheid was abolished, Muslim businesses were primarily confined to supermarkets, clothing retail stores, retail pharmacies, or hardware stores. It is only in the last 30 years since the dismantling of apartheid laws that Muslim businesses were able to diversify and grow their businesses. You may ask, what has allowed a minority Muslim community to flourish in a Christian majority secular state? Muslims in South Africa do not see themselves as anything but South African. This uniqueness of identifying as South African and not by their cultural heritage means that Muslims are accepted in all parts of society. 
they are comfortable to ex exert their Muslim identity and do not see it as debilitating or inferior to anyone else while remaining South African. It is common to see a female Muslim in full abaya at the helm of, of a corporate or a large business or a profession company. Coupled to this is the inherent entrepreneurial DNA of the community who have viewed owning a business, even a small one, as an economic opportunity for advancement. This entrepreneurial spirit has allowed these businesses to endure some of the most repressive laws of the apartheid era overcome the, the economic sanctions that were imposed on the country. These small businesses became the backbone that funded the institutions that serve the community today. We have worked with the democratic government to change laws and policies to accommodate Sharia compliant banking. For instance, in 1999, I lobbied the governor of the Reserve Bank and the tax commissioner to allow for Islamic banking to be treated under the same tax regulations as conventional banks. Since 2010, I have worked with the Department of Economic Development for the halal industry to be adopted within the National Economic Strategy Framework. Yes, there are challenges that these businesses face. Almost all are family owned with informal corporate structures. The founders are patriarchal heads with minimal outside management. This does not allow for external investors or even independent management with new ideas for growth. The second challenge is the thinking of the younger generation who want to explore the world and consider opportunities abroad. Succession planning is a challenge in these circumstances. Both these challenges indicate that these businesses could become stagnant in the near future unless corporate practices are adopted. But there is a younger generation that is emerging who have gained experiences in the corporate world and are now bringing those experiences and strategic thinking back to their family businesses. This younger generation is even building businesses that are fast becoming direct competitors to establish corporates. For example, the Pedro's Chicken franchise, which was started by two young Muslims less than four years ago, has quickly opened franchises across the country and are now a serious competitor to the famous Nando's brand. I am optimistic that the community will continue to grow and shape the national economy while remaining true to their values and belief systems. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank my thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to share these experiences with such an august audience and my appreciation to our moderator and fellow panelists for accommodating me via video. I wish you well in all the deliberations. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was Abraham Patel uh, from South Africa. Do we have also uh, Farouk Kathawi? I am Farooq Kathwari, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive of Ethan Allen Interiors, a global enterprise that got its start more than 91 years ago. I began working with Ethan Allen 45 years back after forming a joint venture between my company and theirs. And I've had the pleasure of leading this enterprise for more than 35 years. Let me start by telling you a little about the company I lead. Ethan Allen is the interior design destination, providing interior design service across several continents. We have 174 design centers in North America and several internationally, staffed by a team of more than 1,000 professional world-class interior designers. We offer complementary design service in each of our locations, which includes complementary home visits and 3D room planning services using state-of-the-art digital technology. As a vertically integrated company, we manufacture about 75% of our products in our North American workshops, which supports our interior design focus by enabling us to offer many custom furniture options. We also operate a national and regional logistics network. We are a public company listed on the New York Stock Exchange 
And recently, we were recognized as America's number one premium furniture retailer and one of America's top 10 retailers overall by Newsweek magazine. This forum is taking place at a very important time with the world facing many challenges. All of us, particularly those in leadership, need to work towards peace and economic betterment. I have always believed that the main job of a leader, whether in an enterprise or in a state, is to help their people become better, while creating a culture where all are treated with dignity and respect. I was born in the beautiful mountains of Kashmir, where the philosophy of Sufism has had a major impact on culture and religion. I believe that Islam is not restricted to one community or, one, or race. Rather, Islam emphasizes the equality of all human beings and the responsibility to help all, irrespective of their religion, race, or cultural beliefs. These principles are relevant when managing a publicly listed enterprise in the United States, and I believe they are relevant all over. The rich cultural and ethnic diversity within the Muslim world is its strength, and it has contributed to a wealth of perspectives and achievements. Unfortunately, the extremism of some has mostly harmed the Muslim population. We face both internal and external challenges. The internal challenge challenges relate to issues of governance and major disparity of income. The external Challenges include the continued impact of colonialism, including the creation of unnatural borders, which have contributed to conflict in many parts of the world. The good news is that Muslim com communities are resilient, and there is tremendous opportunity to make progress. We can overcome the obstacles, develop good governance, and promote economic welfare. Education opportunities are critical, and it is important that they be provided to all sections of the community, especially to women and girls. One noteworthy thing about Ethan Allen is the representation of women within our leadership ranks, which is quite favorable compared to companies in almost every industry. 70% of the leaders in Ethan Allen's retail network are women, and 65% of leaders at our corporate headquarters are women. Interfaith dialogue is also vital. I recently had the opportunity to speak at our newly opened design center in Manhattan, in New York, to young professionals who are part of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. This organization formed after 9-11, and I began co-chairing it with Stanley Bergman, the chairman and CEO of Henry Schein. This organization has Muslim members from many places, each with different concerns. To keep our work focused, we have unified under two pur purposes, bringing the contributions of Muslims and Jewish Americans into greater public awareness and addressing the, the incidents of hate crimes against both communities. In my opinion, it is imperative that major efforts are undertaken to bring people of different faiths together. Otherwise, those with divergent agendas take over. When I spoke at this meeting, I emphasized the importance of hard work at all levels of an organization. I also shared 10 leadership principles that I developed about 30 years back, which continue to guide all that we do at Ethan Allen. The principles include the importance of leading by example, a reminder to embrace change and new opportunities, to react quickly at pivotal moments and be client-focused. Again, we emphasize setting an example of hard work, keeping excellence and innovation top of mind, setting priorities by differentiating between big issues and small ones, and having the confidence to empower others. The final principle, and perhaps the most important, is justice, making fair and thoughtful decisions, 
and treating everyone with dignity and respect. When I took on the challenge of helping to transform a quintessential American company into a player on the global stage, the perspective that I thought with me from the mountains of Kashmir gave me unique insights that could only come from the time I spent in that part of the world. The benefit of diversity is the wisdom you achieve because you see issues from many perspectives. It is a pleasure to share my perspectives in this important meeting and at this critical time, and to again emphasize that the main job of a leader is to help their people become better. If you're part of a group that is underrepresented in leadership, you have to work even harder to be successful. The harder you work, the more you achieve, and the more you inspire others to achieve along with you. When we help others, we have a legacy that inspires others to take action. The call to help the people around us and in other parts of the world is a call to which every leader must respond. It is a great pleasure to share my thoughts at this very important business forum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm left with a bit of a quandary. We have three minutes to sum up and also invite questions. Perhaps we um, leave the questions till lunchtime. You, you know the speakers. You can approach them. Uh, because I don't want to impinge on the next uh, uh, eminent speakers who are coming along. But I will try and summarize uh, with three points. Uh, divergent though the speakers were from the uh, center of excellence in, 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 in um, uh, Thailand to uh, the, the, the call for, uh, for us to be risk mitigating and to innovate, the examples given in UK, US, and we heard from Ethan Allen, also in South Africa. We can summarize the, Mus uh, the Muslims in minorities in three ways. And three very important ways, I think, which are relevant to this forum. First is the Muslims in the minority situations do count. They form a significant part of the Ummah. And there is an ongoing need for the majority Muslim countries to recognize the importance of the minorities, whether it's through the role of people, uh, organizations like Jakim or others, and the Islamic Chamber of Commerce. Number two, it's a very youthful population worldwide. And this youthful population brings with it a lot of challenges. And these youthful populations, and I believe, judging by the examples we've seen, are innovating, are being very resilient, and I think we have a lot positive things to look forward to. And the last and perhaps the final point is that we are in a forum which looks at innovation. A lot of the examples we heard are not just innovations for Muslims, the innovations to solve the problems of the world. And that's where the Muslims in minorities can actually be a real uh, beacon. They can help solve not just the issues arising in Muslim communities, but communities worldwide, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslims. Thank you so much. I'd like to finish up by thanking Dato, uh, Dato Lamo. Your, you know, I'm sorry we didn't have an opportunity to have question and answers, but I think we have to be very careful about not overspending our time. And uh, um, Dr. Ahmed, thank you so much for your time over here. Can we have a thank you for the? If you would allow me just one sentence, I'm from the Federation of Islamic Associations of New Zealand. We are a very small country, but we had a major disaster there, a man-made disaster, which, as you all know, 51 people died at Masjid al-Nur. Our thoughts and our prayers for those victims, uh, you will get, we will send you information on the Federation later on. We would like to be part of the ongoing narrative. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it